Don't, don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. You're listening to the Live to Create podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash live to create. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the official Live to Create podcast coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. I am your host, Shane Almgren, and I am joined today from Phoenix, Arizona by international slam dunk champion, Kenny Dobbs. Kenny has appeared on ESPN, Fox Sports, NBA TV, as well as the new TNT show, The Dunk King. His spectacular feats of aerial creativity have garnered him sponsorships from Sprite and Nike, and LeBron James has called him the greatest dunker in the world. Kenny has toured with the NBA and Sprite as a celebrity dunker, performing in front of sold-out stadiums during halftime shows, celebrity games, and NBA All-Star weekends. His amazing dunk moves were used as the inspiration for the dunks featured in the NBA 2K13 video game. Kenny is also a motivational speaker, using his foundation Uprise Youth Movement to empower youth of all ages with a challenging yet empowering message of hope. Kenny, thanks a lot for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here, and I want to dive right in. And before we get to the basketball stuff, which I'm dying to do, I think it's important that we start kind of where you came from, your backstory. I know you didn't play high school basketball, and I know also in high school you sort of got yourself into a little bit of trouble and were headed down to a path that ultimately could have taken your life in a completely different direction. Right. Do you want to start off by talking about that? Sure. Well, for me, basically, I grew up in an environment where there was a lot of drugs and gangs and violence and things like that. West Phoenix area, uh, the area I grew up in was called Maryville, and that's kind of, uh, it was one of the worst neighborhoods back then. And at the same time, both of my parents were using drugs and alcohol. My dad sold drugs, was involved in that lifestyle. So it was kind of, you know, something that I've seen around in the neighborhood, at the same time, seen right there in my own home. So every weekend, it was kind of like a big party at my house growing up and, you know, music, drugs, alcohol. I began, you know, coming out seeing that and I would take sips of alcohol here and there and I'd see how my uncles and my dad's friends, you know, how they kind of pat me on the back, you know, kind of thing. And uh, that's kind of the way I've seen it. Like, you know, okay, I'm get approval and get, you know, praise from my elders and the people that I looked up to. Um, by being, you know, hanging out, being around in that kind of environment. So uh, by the time I was 10, 11 years old, I began smoking marijuana for the first time. By 13, I was selling drugs. By 15, I had moved from marijuana to cocaine to methamphetamines. And by 17 and a half years old, I was sitting in a jail cell looking at six to nine years in prison for robbery. So that's kind of like a sped up version of, you know, how quickly things can progress and go down, you know, the wrong path when you're making those kind of negative decisions. So was there a singular event that was the turning point for you when you decided that you were going to straighten out? I can't say necessarily there was one event. I think there was a series of events that took place in my life that made that big impact on my heart and mind that always caused me to think about, you know, making that change. When I was probably like eight, eight years old, eight or nine years old, my mom and dad uh, went through a separation, you know, on the brink of divorce. Uh, my mom no longer wanted to live that lifestyle where drugs and alcohol and parties and all that kind of stuff was our lifestyle. Years later, I found out, you know, there was a lot of drug deals that had gone wrong. I, I just thought, hey, we live in a bad neighborhood. That's why our house keeps getting broken into. That's why I see people, you know, my dad fighting with people and pointing guns and all that kind of stuff. I just thought, you know, this is just our environment, our neighborhood. But, you know, later I find out, and you know, these are drug deals that have gone wrong and all this other stuff. So uh, I know one specific time somebody broke into our house and I was asleep in the living room couch and nobody else was in there. My parents are in their room and I wake up hearing glass and seeing somebody's hand, you know, reaching through the glass to unlock the door. And I run to my parents' room, tell my dad, hey, somebody's breaking into our house. You know, get up, get up. And he runs and sprints to the door down the hallway. And by the time I turn the corner on the hallway, I just see him wrestling with some guy. And the guy has a gun in his hand. And 
Uh, I think after that was like my mom was just, that's enough. I'm done. You know, either get out of this lifestyle, stop using drugs and alcohol or else, you know, you know, I want a divorce. I'm taking the kids. And so I think, uh, you know, months went by that my, that I was having to go visit my mom, go visit my dad, you know, bouncing back and forth. And I just know that I didn't like that. You know, mostly it was affecting me. I was mad. I didn't understand what was going on. I just thought it was my mom that was like no longer wanted my dad around and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I started getting into a lot of trouble in school, started fighting, started being kicked out of uh, elementary schools. I went through like 11 different elementary schools until the time I was like, you know, going into eighth grade. And then even so, you know, my parents ended up changing their life. My mom began going to church. My dad ended up changing his life, you know, on the brink of their divorce. Having to realize it's either, you know, lose my wife, lose my son, my daughter, or get rid of these drugs and alcohol and the friends that were pulling him down. So I seen him change his life. For me, it's just seeing my own father turn away from that lifestyle. But at the same time, I was already exposed to that lifestyle and that environment, and I didn't want to make a change, you know? So 11 years old, 12 years old, I'm doing my own thing now, all the way up. So my dad always told me, man, son, this life is about choices, and the path that I was choosing to live would only end up two ways with me either dead or in jail. You know, another big event that impacted my life was my older cousin. You know, I was the second oldest of all of the grandchildren in my family, and um, you know, I looked up to him so much. You know, for the way that he dressed, talked, carried himself, things that he did. I spent a lot of time with him, and that's what made the the gang life so appealing to me. But he always told me, and him and his friends always told me, he was like, you don't need to be part of this. You got too much talent, because I was always playing sports as a kid, basketball, football, baseball, soccer. So they would tell me I need to focus on my athleticism and, you know, become a pro, pro athlete and whatnot, my dreams. So... Um, But my cousin passed away when he was 19 years old, and um, that made me the oldest of all the grandchildren now. I was about 15, 16 years old. So before he passed away, I remembered him changing his life, and, you know, he began telling me that I want to be somebody who's a leader in my community where I go back into the streets and start pulling kids out of gangs because he had spent so much time, you know, with a lot of older gang members who are in prison or in the neighborhoods who you know, tell the truth about the situation that it's not all glitz and glam and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's not all, uh, it's not something that they want their family to be part of. And so with him, he changed his life and got out of that gang life, got all the street life, stopped using drugs and alcohol and everything. And uh, wanted to start impacting kids' lives and pulling them out of the streets, out of the gang life. And he came to me and spent time with me and pulled me into some men's discipleship meetings where, you know, they would begin doing street ministry and, you know, kind of sharing the love of God in people's lives and, and things like that. And, you know, I never really wanted to be part of it, but... You know, when he passed away at 19, it made me the oldest of all the grandchildren. And I actually began to think, you know, like he said, I need to be a leader for my family because they all look up to me. Uh, All of my younger cousins looked up to me because I played sports and uh, excelled at everything that I did. You know, he would tell me tell me to be a leader for our family. And when he passed away, it made me the oldest of all the grandchildren now, you know, so. I realized, like, if I didn't if I didn't step up and change that they would all follow in my footsteps. Having all of that in my mind, sitting in a jail cell, there was another big piece. The officer told me, you know, that, hey, you're 17 and a half years old. You know, the judge is going to try you as an adult. And so you're looking at six to nine years in prison with your your long hair and your pretty face. They're going to love you in there. And it was a a little joke. (laughs) That's a wake up call. Yeah, a little joke for his police humor, but at the same time, I knew exactly what he was talking about. You know, I had uncles that had been in prison. I had seen the movies of prison and all kinds of stuff, so I knew what he was talking about. And, you know, that night as I was sitting in there thinking, like, man, if somebody tries to disrespect me in prison, you know, it's kind of like you're fighting for your life in there. And you're not just fighting against one man. You're you're fighting against, you know, multiple people, so... As tough as I thought I was in the streets, you know, and in school, you're just a little boy, when you know, amongst men when you go to prison. So uh, I just realized, like, man, this six to nine years could turn into me spending life in prison. And so it, it kind of left me having a, a gut check, you know, my heart, my mind kind of really searching that night. And uh, that was the first time that I had ever really cried out to God. I remember hitting my knees and begging him for a second chance, opportunity, and making a commitment and promise that I would change my life if, if I got out of this situation. And during that same time, I began to think and, you know, look at my life, look at all the decisions that I was making, you know, and realize, like, where I had gone wrong. Uh, 
uh, realized how many negative influence I allowed in my life, like drugs, alcohol, music, and, you know, the friends and the neighborhood. Uh, right after that, I began, you know, kind of just having like a moment of clarity there. And I really, really felt, you know, through prayer that that God was kind of showing me, you know, the things that I needed to do to change my life and the things I needed to do to be able to separate myself from the streets and the, and uh, that negative activity. And uh, so I began to write down on a little piece of paper, like what my goals would be in order to accomplish my dream. If I got a second chance and got out of this, what would I be doing with my life? So I kind of took accountability for the first time and set some goals. You're 17 years old and you have the wherewithal to sit down and actually map out goals, like put them down. Right. Well, that was the first time that I had ever done that. It was also the first time that I had ever really quieted myself down enough to even pray with a humble and humility of just realizing that I was wrong. You know, as a teenager, you always think you're right. Your parents are wrong. You know, everybody else is against you. So as I'm doing that, I begin to realize, like, man, what happened to me? As a kid, my, my walls were all filled with posters of Michael Jordan and all of these famous athletes and Jerry Rice and my favorite football and basketball teams. And growing up, that's what adored my walls. But now, you know, as I'm a teenager, I'm looking and thinking, man, all I got in my room is posters of Tupac and Biggie and all these hip-hop artists and pictures of marijuana and all kinds of things like that, you know, sexy girls and whatnot. So when I look at that and then I look at my lifestyle, those were all the things that I was chasing, those same type of images and, you know, idols basically that I had posted on my own walls. So I kind of began to take accountability of everything that I, that I had allowed in my life. I kind of looked at that time like, okay, you know, here's my circle. I drew a little circle on a piece of paper and put a dot in the middle and say okay here's me and here's my inner circle what have I allowed in or, you know I begin to think is the music that I'm listening to helping me towards my dreams and goals or is it holding me back are these drugs holding me back or are they helping me you know as my friends who I hang out with on a daily basis are they uplifting me to accomplish my goals and dreams or are they holding me back are they detouring me and I've never done that before I've never even seen that happen or you know, never had that thought to do that. So I definitely felt like, you know, God was inspiring me to really think and expose myself to, you know, what the environments, what were the influences that I have allowed in my life. And then after doing that, I realized like, man, all of these things have been sidetracking me and pulling me down or pulling me away, you know, and what is my purpose? What is my passion? What are, what are the talents that God has given me in this life? And, and I began to think about that, like, man, you know, I would love to become a professional athlete. I would love to be able to speak to young people just how my cousin was telling me he wanted to do, to go back into the streets and, you know, share his testimony with other young kids about how he got out of that gang life, how he got out of the drugs and the addictions and all that stuff. So I began to think, like, I want to use my ability and my platform to become a professional athlete to actually go and speak to youth and influence them to you know, set their goals and separate themselves from those negative obstacles and achieve their dream. And that was all something that started right then and there. You know, to make a long story short, I'm sitting there in, in you know, in front of the judge months later and, you know, the arresting officer didn't file some paperwork correctly. The the witness from the crime didn't show up to court and my three friends that had gotten caught, you know, I got away from the robbery back then, but my three friends got caught. And they're the ones that turned me in, told the police my name, where I, where to find me and everything. You know, another code of the street is like, you don't snitch, you don't rat, you don't snitch on your homies and this and that. So there's kind of like codes and rules of the streets that we govern ourselves and live by. And when that was broken, when I realized like they had turned me in to save their own neck, to save themselves, you know, that kind of broke that mold and mentality of my own mind. Like, man, these people aren't even down for me. You know, th this is all just, it's just a facade that I was looking up to. I was the only one keeping the loyalty there. So I realized that I had turned my back on the people that truly cared for me, you know, in my own, for my family and, and God. And when the judge read my sentence off, she said, you're, you're definitely the leader in the situation. You had possession charges you've already had assault charges so you know you're definitely going to be the one that's held responsible so i had to pay thousands of dollars for like the helicopter chase for the police coming out for damaged property and everything but i remember when she clapped a little hammer down i was just waiting to find out how much time she was going to give me and then she clapped her little hammer down and i knew it was done and my attorney turned to me and just said man it's a miracle that you're not going to prison right now and uh, so when he said that word miracle, it just reminded me, it's just like, 
rewinded myself right back to when I was in that jail cell, praying, crying out to God, begging him for a second chance and making a promise that I would change my life. And uh, immediately just kind of had this awareness of, of God, our creator, actually listening and moving, you know, his little hand in my own little situation, you know, out of all the things that he, he has to care about and worry about, you know, he showed up for me, you know, it's changed my life ever since then. But from that point on, I, I made that commitment and that promise to God and I've, you know, been keeping it ever since. Uh, I went back out of that situation, my first, you know, the goal and the dream, I took all that little notes that I wrote down in, in that cell and then I transferred it into a big notebook and I, you know, on the notebook I said, this is my dream journal. And I began to write down my goals and dreams inside that notebook and then that's a practice that I still do to this day. But the first thing I wrote down was get drafted in San B.A., you know, become a professional athlete. And that was such a big, huge dream and a big goal that I realized, like, you know, I need to break this down into smaller goals. And that's what began to give me a plan of action. So as I broke it down all the way down, the first thing I realized I had to do was get back into school, get my high school diploma. I was a senior. It was already towards the end of my senior year at that time. So I'm 17 and a half years old. Everybody's getting ready to graduate. I go talk to the principal and say, you know, I want to get my high school diploma. What's it going to take? You know, they looked at my transcripts and everything and says, you know, you only have three credits. It's impossible for you to graduate. You know, it's basically like you've only completed, you know, not even a semester of your freshman year kind of throughout all those years because I had been kicked out of high school every year plus dropped out at 15 years old. So I had only passed PE and art. I only went to PE class because, you know, we played basketball uh, in there. And then I went to art class only because I sat next to the prettiest girl in school who, who later became my, one of my <laughs> girlfriends. And so, you know, I was on time for art class every day. But other than that, I, I you know, didn't really have no priority of, of getting an education or going to school. So it was more a socializing kind of uh, business kind of thing because I was selling drugs as well on campus. So as I'm talking to the counselor and the principals, they just suggest, you know, it'd be better for you just drop out, get your GED and go out there and start working. But I had to begin to explain to them is like, look, you know, my, I begin to share my testimony, my story. I set a goal for myself. This is what I know I need to do. And I'm not going to let anything stop me from doing it. My oldest cousin passed away. I'm the oldest of my family. So if I take the easy route out, get my GED, what kind of message am I going to send home to my younger siblings and cousins that when times get hard, you know, mm -hmm. just take the easy route out, drop out, get your GED like Kenny did. You know, I didn't want to be. Uh, I didn't want it to be that standard for my family. So they actually began to work with me. They seen my hunger and they seen that I was serious about it. They ended up putting a whole schedule program together for me. Uh, I went through the whole summer. I went through the whole next year. I went to school from like 7.30 in the morning till 6.30 at night. Then I would take these online classes. And I basically grinded like that with no spring break or summer vacation for the next two years. You crammed four years worth of schooling into two years. Yeah, as embarrassing as it sounds, I actually graduated with my younger sister. But the, it, I didn't care about none of that because to me it was, you know, I wasn't looking at, you know, what are going to people think about me. I was more so thinking of I have a goal, I have a dream to accomplish, and I'm not going to let anything stop me from it. So I remember getting my high school diploma, you know, principal shaking my hand, telling me how proud he was, making a confession that he honestly didn't think I was going to, be able to pull it off and he just told me how much I taught him to believe in every kid that every kid has the possibility of success you know and there's hope for every kid there's no exceptions I almost cried when he told me that but when I took that diploma home and I gave it to my my parents seeing my mom crying it was nothing new I had always seen her cry but I've never seen them crying tears of joy instead of pain or sorrow so I almost cried but my dad he never would call me son he you know he'd always call me boy or or something else so but I mean he uh when he gave me a hug and told me I'm proud of you son it, it really just broke me down and I just began crying like a newborn baby boy it was just such a tremendous feeling and um, knowing that I had accomplished that, knowing that I had stuck with it, all the sacrifice and everything that I went through to make that happen, and then to see the uh, impact on other people's lives, it was kind of like, man, I want to I wanna feel like this for the rest of my life, you know, that I'm impacting people's lives in a positive way. And uh, I remember after that, I began, I joined the uh, substance abuse and gang prevention uh, classes for the state of Arizona and became a leader in their youth advisory council. They created a youth advisory council based off of me because I, I, I had joined those classes being court, court appointed early on 
and then, you know, quickly rose within a couple of months to becoming a leader because the other kids didn't even want to be there. They were just there because the judge made them come. For me, I was ready to change. And, you know, when I would see kids being disrespectful or not caring, I'm like, you know, you guys need to step up, man. You guys don't change your lives now. You're going to end up in this same situation a year later, you know. So I would begin to voice, you know, my, my opinions and, and thoughts and hold people accountable in the class. And uh, one of the ladies there, uh, she said, man, we would like to, you know, sit down and meet with you and have you meet our director. You know, they had a meeting with me and I began to tell them, you know, you guys aren't doing this stuff right. You can't just come in there and tell kids what they need to do. You can't be having people coming in with business suits and ties and showing off their degrees. You need people with real life experience, you know, people that can say, hey, I've been in your place and this is how I've right. stepped out. This is how I've become successful. You know, they basically began saying, well, okay, how would you run it? And I began to give them my ideas and we met for months. And later on, they wrote a grant and ended up getting three and a half million dollars from the government uh, for this grant to create a youth advisory board, youth advisory council for substance abuse and gang prevention. And then they uh, they nominated me and, and selected me to become the chair for the for that whole council. And so for three years, I ran that for the state of Arizona. I received awards from our governor. I got selected from Washington, D.C. to fly out and speak to legislator on behalf of what, what I've done for Arizona's youth because our numbers had increased of the impact and also the, uh, decreased for the number of offenders from these youth programs that would go back into it. You know, most kids would go into the program and then go right back into doing what they were doing as soon as their time was up. I had increased numbers and I had also decreased numbers of, of the return offenders. So I spoke to a legislator in D.C. and told all these people, you know, how they needed to change certain policies that affected, you know, servicing kids. You know, you need to make it to where people can get jobs that have life experience, not just only book smarts. And um, that's what happened. And people began getting jobs nowadays with behavioral health type things. Part of the qualifications is, you know, have you had a son that has went through drugs and all this other stuff? So that way, when a mother comes to a kid and their mother is saying, man, my son was just like you. And now he's in prison for the rest of his life. Kids are listening to real life experiences and stories that are going to touch their hearts emotionally rather than just listen to somebody that says, hey, you need to do what I'm telling you because... You know, I have my degree for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They needed to feel that people have actually walked in their shoes, and, and that's what I was giving them. So after doing that, man, I had impacted hundreds of kids through that program. I set up like 35 different youth committees across Arizona, um, not just only in the inner city, but also as far out into the native reservations. And when I began going to these native, native reservations, I realized, like, man... These kids are worse off than the kids in the inner cities, you know? There's more higher substance abuse and alcohol rate. There's more dropouts. There's more suicides. And, you know, at that point is when I said, you know, I'm a, I want to really focus and impact kids in, in, the, in the native uh, communities. And also being that I myself, I'm, I'm an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Having that native culture in my own heart was a passion. But I also knew at the same time as like, man, I'm only affecting hundreds. I want to be affecting hundreds of thousands you know millions mm -hmm. and uh that's when kind of god began to put that passion in my heart to go back to basketball you know i began i quit my job in 2006 or 2007 i was actually pushing a mail you know being a mailman for the arizona arizona department of health services and then on my on my after hours time is when i was doing the youth advisory council work for substance abuse and gang prevention um, and then at the same time, I had already had my daughter. So I was like, man, this, you know, this is not going to be my life. I need to chase my dreams and goals. And so I quit my job and it took me eight months to begin training. I went to, I went, walked on and got a full scholarship for college, began going to school for music and video production. Uh, at the same time, I began training for basketball for the first time, really having a coach telling me what to do and uh, begin to get lifting weights and all of that. And then every year there was a local dunk competition, and I had been winning that contest since I was like 17 or 18 years old. But this year I came out and competed, and I won the contest, and Shaquille O'Neal's cousin happened to be there. He came up to me and said, man, Shaq's having a national dunk contest in L.A. if you want to come out. And uh, I said, yeah, for sure. When is it? He said, it's tomorrow. And so I was like, man. They got me a flight the next day. I flew out there to L.A., went straight from the plane to the contest. And when I get there, man, all of these guys who are dunking are, you know, bigger than me and, you know, stronger than me and uglier than me. They're yelling and dunking and shaking the rim. I'm just, 
I was intimidated so much to where I didn't even warm up. I just put my shoes, my clothes on, and kind of sat there and watched these guys. But luckily, I didn't get called first. I ended up going fifth in the contest, so I got to watch the competition a little bit. And these guys were doing the same dunks that they were doing in warm-ups. So I realized, like, maybe these guys aren't as good as I think they are. And, you know, I went up there and just did my own, my, my normal routine, which was I would start with a off the backboard, throw the ball up, off the backboard, jump, catch it, windmill it in the air, and slam it home. And everybody went crazy for me, being that I was only, like, 6'3", and I looked different than everybody else, and my braids are flying through the air and all that. So I ended up winning that contest and winning a big old check from Shaq and winning a big old trophy that was... He dipped his big old size 32 shoe into a into bronze and put the big bronze shoe on top of a big wooden plaque trophy. Mm, that's cool. So it's, it was one of the coolest trophies I had ever seen and one of the biggest checks I had ever won. And uh, the video hit the internet and was pretty successful overnight. And when I got back home, I remember my coach, my players from the team were like, man, you killed that contest. That was crazy. We seen it on the internet and all this. And then the coaches say, hey, you, you didn't take the check and the prize, did you? And I said, yeah, I did. Of course I did. And then they began to tell me the rules as far as when you're on a scholarship, you can't receive prize money or a trophy or anything and so a week later did you return it or they were there ncaa violations or what was going on there well they basically told me that you know there were certain rules in place for all of that and i would have to kind of like look for other options for going to school that they still wanted me to play they still wanted me there but i'd have to kind of like you know do it through financial aid and all this other stuff i didn't know about the resources that i had like just being being native american there's so many grants and opportunities that i could have went to school mm -hmm. but I, I didn't realize that and i also just thought man that sucks you know well and i'm definitely not going to pay for it and i'm not going to put myself in the debt just to go to school and so i didn't know what was going to happen but like i said kind of god worked in mysterious ways and there's a plan and purpose for everything and a week later is when Sprite actually gave me a call and said, hey, we, we're, we're hosting, we're building a national dunk competition and we want you to be involved. You know, that was just a week later. So I began training and practicing for that. You know, that's kind of like what you begin to see where I begin going into every city. Uh, they went through every, pretty much, they went through 10 cities. It was like New York, Chicago, Atlanta, Philadelphia, you know, pretty much all the meccas of basketball for the United States. And, mm -hmm. You know, I would go out there and compete, and, and, and I would win those competitions in every city, you know. And um, in 2012, they had a big national contest where LeBron James hosted it. You know, they basically put out the search for the best dunker. All these different people came from all these different countries, as well as all throughout the United States. And, you know, they had these competitions that went from hundreds to 50 to 20 to 10 to the final four. And then they held the final four contest at All-Star Weekend uh, in Orlando 2012. And LeBron was the host. I ended up going out there and doing some crazy dunks, putting on a great show. That's the video that I'm sure everybody has seen. And uh, where, I, where I brought out the first ever blindfold dunk uh, where I jumped over oh, yeah. three people. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, jumped over three people between the legs with a blindfold on. And Cedric Sabalas actually came out and blindfolded me. And that wasn't like the D Brown, I'm peeking out over my elbow and I'm looking like I'm blind, but you were actually legit blindfolded. Right, so as far as dunking goes, like I've done that dunk plenty of times where I jump over three people between the legs. Mm -hmm. And so I pretty much figured that you know, I, I place people strategically, you know, measured between where the rim is at. So I knew that if I just jumped and I could feel the ball, then I would know exactly the measurement of where I was, you know, in the air. And so that's pretty much what I did. You know, my approach is always the same on every dunk where I would start from the top of the key and I'd go in there to jump. So I kind of just had to fill it out. And I took off and immediately reached up and felt the ball. And I, I just, you know, let it let it go into a natural motion. Ended up hitting the dunk on my very first try. And everybody went crazy. And that was the dunk right there where it was just, it was just contest was over. Uh, Kevin Durant, Kobe Bryant, Serge Ibaka. I mean, all these different athletes came out to watch and congratulate me. And then LeBron James, you know, the best player in the NBA at that time, handed me the trophy. And uh, that was a wrap. I was recognized internationally as the best slam dunk artist in the world at that time in 2012. And then um, I took that trophy, gave it a big kiss. Had been chasing that dream for so long. And then... Um, Lifted my hands up to the sky, thank God, and then pointed out to the crowd with my family and thanked my family. And right after that, the uh, general manager for the Dallas Mavericks, he was the GM, uh, Donnie Nelson, came to me and said, man, for 30 years I've been involved in the NBA. I've never seen 
anybody put on a performance like that. Can you play ball? And he began asking me my questions. I'd tell him my story and everything. And after that, he's just like, man, your athleticism is obviously, you know, having a 48-inch vertical, he knows how impressive that is. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the NBA had had that. And for for me to go in with my story as well, he just said, man, we want to we wanna give you a tryout with the Mavericks organization. And so I, pre I pretty much put everything else I was doing on hold for the next eight months. I just began to train. I began to practice with players like Mike Bibby, Robert Ory, Adrian Peterson, uh, different guys that began imparting certain wisdom. You know, my cousin played professional football. And so I got to go out there and learn about speed and explosiveness with Adrian Peterson. And, you know, seeing how he worked out for me made a huge impact to this day in my life. You know, I realized that, man, you don't get paid for what you're doing on the field. You're really getting paid for the hours that you're putting in on a daily basis right. in this gym, you know. And uh, that's where I began to take my training more seriously. And after putting in all that work, I, go, I went out there for the tryouts and uh, had a dream come true. Ended up getting drafted, you know, into the NBA organization with, with the Dallas Mavericks and uh, got put in with their uh, D-League team called the Texas Legends and uh, began training and playing with them. You know, it was a dream come true. And then not it was a very high to a very low because not too long after that, I ended up getting into an injury. I had a big player land into my foot and put all his pressure into my knee with my foot locked into place. So I fractured my foot and tore my meniscus in my MCO. Mm. And it was done and over with that quickly. So I was really down and depressed. Like, man, after all that hard work, God, why did I have to go through this? Why couldn't you rehab that? Why wasn't that part of the, the plan? Yeah, I rehabbed it. It took me about four to six months to rehab because I didn't want to get surgery. And um, after all of that, I remember jumping as hard as I could after doing all that re rehab, you know, for the first time really jumping to test out my strength. And I remember jumping and barely the tip of my middle finger nicked the bottom of the rim. And that's when I knew like, man, oh, there's no doubt that I'm going to have to get surgery. I ended up leaving. I came back home. At the time I was living in Dallas and I was still supporting and paying for my family back home in Arizona with my, my wife and kids. So financially I had drained, you know, all the savings that I had, I had pretty much drained it on that dream there and uh, at the same time as I was injured I also began working to develop a mobile app and develop my comic book and you know kind of my own brand mm -hmm. so I was doing that at the same time you know I ended up having surgery on June 2nd 2014 I knew that if you know if I was gonna give it a shot to, to make this thing happen again I was gonna have to have surgery and so I did. At the same time that I was injured and down, you know, I was doing a lot of soul searching and praying and asking God, why would this happen? And, you know, after all this hard work. And I remember looking at my goal list, you know, back in my, my room at my mom's house. She still had my stuff on the wall and she showed me my goal list. She said, you know, look, here's your dream. There was a thing called a dream capsule. It was like a little necklace. And inside of that, it was a scroll, a little tiny scroll, a piece of paper where you're supposed to write down your three top goals. And my number one top goal on there was get drafted into the NBA. <laughs> you know, it didn't say play 15 years in the NBA. It Mission didn't say become an all-star champion <laughs> in the NBA. But it said get drafted. And so that kind of made me cry in itself to let me know, like, you know what? God does have a sense of humor. And for me, my own will, the way I was, I'm tunnel visioned when I have a mission and a, and a purpose. So I said, I'm going to do this. And so I put everything else I was doing on hold, all of my ministry work, all of my youth stuff, all of my reaching the kids, doing the tours, everything to chase that dream and goal. And, you know, I'm sure I could have done great things if I had millions of dollars. You know, I could have invested and done a lot of cool stuff to impact people. But with the NBA schedule, how hard and impactful it is, you know, I know that I wouldn't be able to be hands on with kids on a daily basis how I am right. now. You know, every week I'm impacting thousands of youth in, in different cities every single week. So I kind of see God's plan now that, you know, back then I didn't understand or I didn't see. But now I know that, you know, his plan and his purpose for me was to be able to build this platform and use a thing like basketball to be able to put me in places in front of people that need to hear my story, you know, for lives that need to be changed, need to be impacted. And so after that, uh, that's when I began saying, okay, well, what am I going to do for my future? And that's where I began working to get my mobile app, uh, working to organize my own dunk competitions, my own brands, and uh, also my comic book. Uh, during that time, I also launched my own nonprofit, 501c3, 
called the Dare to Dream Foundation, where I began working with youth um, for youth leadership. And then um, I also developed my, my tours where I would be going in, visiting schools all across the nation and uh, providing motivational speaking and slam dunk assemblies. You know, that, that became my passion after that. You know, every single school I would go and I'd just say, man, if I could just reach one kid on every single event that I do, that all of my time and, you know, my life is, is being, you know, put into good use. And I was just so overwhelmed because as I began doing that, my inboxes on my messages, my emails, I got letters. I would have all kinds of stuff from just people after every event, you know, even coming up to me in tears just saying how much my story meant to them, that they're in the same place in their life where I was at before I changed, you know. Even people that have said, man, I was, I've been contemplating suicide over this past two weeks. I've already even planned out how I was going to do it and begin writing letters to my family. You know, one girl was crying so hard because she, she was like, you know, I haven't been in school for two weeks, you know, and this is what I was planning on doing. And I only came because I seen your picture and poster around up in the city and just thought that you were, you know, gorgeous. So I wanted to come out and meet you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, hearing your story is, is gave me hope. And, it, and you know, you, I want you to know that you saved my life. You know, those kind of things like that, for me, now I understand God's purpose. Because if I had been playing in the NBA, I wouldn't have been sitting in that room at that time. You know, so it just impacted me so much, man. And that's where I've been doing now to where that's my full-time thing that I do. You know, definitely could be making more finances, playing ball overseas or doing other things. But it, it's not about the money. It's more so about the impact that I'm making and, you know, having a fulfillment in my own life. I'm able to take my wife, my daughters with me. And um, not only are they, you know, being homeschooled and getting their education, they're getting real-life hands-on education, you know, working and seeing the impact in people's lives. So it's been awesome. I want to talk about your mobile app that you've got coming out. I also want to talk some, just some basketball stuff. Where do you get your inspiration from when you're coming up with new dunks to do? On the dunking side, I had always been inspired with dunking since I was a kid. You know, watching videos of like Michael Jordan, seeing the dunk competitions online or on ESPN or whatever, when they would show those highlights of Michael Jordan and Dominique Wilkins and all that. Mm -hmm. And I remember my dad, for my 10th birthday, they bought me a hoop. And it was like kind of like when the first kind of hoops came out where you, could, where you could use a broom and lower the hoop down to seven feet. I remember he would make me only be able to play on 10 feet. He never wanted me to shoot on lower rims and all that. But when he would leave and go to work and I'd come home from school, I would lower that rim down to seven feet. <laughs> and me and all my friends from the neighborhood... We'd all have our dunk contest and say, you know, I'm Michael Jordan, or I'm Spud Webb, I'm, I'm Dominique, I'm, you know, this and that. And so I'd always choose to be Dominique Wilkins because I just loved how, you know, he was a two-foot jumper. I loved his, his power, his windmills. Plus, you know, he wore number 21, which was my basketball, was my number that I, that I you know, had first wore when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I'm Dominique. So his main dunk was that windmill with power. And so that became like my go-to signature your dunk and uh, we'd always have those little dunk offs as a kid so that gave me the passion and love for dunking uh, but it wasn't until later on like you know watching Vince Carter in, in 2000 when he when he came out with the windmill 360 yeah. and he came out with the between legs and all that and I was just like man that's the best dunker, you know, that's the GOAT, you know, of all time. And nobody's going to be able to beat that ever. You know, those kind of things begin making me work on creativity. How old were you when you dunked on a 10-foot hoop the first time? Oh, my first dunk was at a park um, going into my freshman year. We'd always go to this neighborhood park and always looked up to these older dudes who were in high school and all that. You know, I'd see them dunking. And every time after the game, me and one of my other friends, Julius, would always be trying to dunk the ball you know, on 10 feet. And so I remember I got my first little rim rattling dunk, you know, mm -hmm. where it didn't even go flush through. It just bounced from the hoop, like, yeah. <laughs> and went in, but it dropped in and, you know, it counted. Counts. So that's two points. When that happened for me, I was just so pumped up about it that every single day from that point on, I was just trying to dunk it flush, you know, and then when I started dunking it flush, I wanted to dunk with two hands. It just became a daily thing where we would always go play ball after school and, um, you know, spend time trying to dunk it. But at the same time, I was getting ready for football because I wanted to play football. And so I began doing things that I didn't realize where it was plyometrics, but it was, you know, kind of like a plyometrics routine where we had like a four foot fence in front of our front yard. So I would jump up, land on it, 
jump back down, jump back up, jump back down, jump back up, jump back down. You know, I'd spend hours just outside when we would be doing that. We'd play our games and whatnot, and then I'd quickly go knock out, you know, 50 or 100 of those jumps, which technically would be a box jump, mm-hmm. you know. And then sometimes I would jump all the way over the fence and then jump all the way back over and over and over, side going sideways, you know. So I was doing lateral jumps and other things we do was like frog jumps down the street and we would run and we would race. So all of that stuff was working on fast twitch muscles, but I didn't realize that I was actually training for that. I was just doing what I was, what I, what I had seen other people doing for football. And so I began to see my hops increasing um, after doing that, you know, pretty much every day throughout that whole entire summer. You know, freshman year, I began throwing it down with two hands. By my sophomore year, now I began windmilling the ball, throwing it off of the backboard. And, you know, so I, I, I never really practiced any other trick dunks back then. Once I was able to do the windmill, I was just like, that's it, you know? <laughs> and so it wasn't until later on when I entered those dunk competitions that I realized, like, man, there's actually people out there that are dunking. And that's when YouTube exploded. And I had a national dunk competition with Shaquille O'Neal, that contest. And that's why I seen this guy named Troy McRae. He was only like five foot nine or five foot ten from like Atlanta or something. And I seen this fool jump up and take the ball between his legs and dunk it. And like I said, you know, I just thought, man, Vince, nobody's going to be able to do that. You know, nobody can be Vince like that, you know. And man, in order to go between the legs, you got to be like six foot eight, or you know, you have to be an NBA player to be able to do a dunk like that. And when I seen this full Trump McCray do that between the legs dunk, you know, it, it kind of broke down that barrier in my own mind. You know, that was a barrier that I set up in my own mind to say, you'll never be able to do that. You know, you got to be an NBA player, or you got to be at least six eight, you know, to go between the legs. So I never tried. I never would even test myself to try it. And when I seen him do that in that contest with Troy McCray being only 5'10", and knowing that my vertical was higher than his and I'm taller, that's where I was like, oh, no, heck no. I can, I know I could do this. And I got in the gym, and within two days, boom, I was knocking down between the legs dunks. And that's when I began to, like, realize, like, man, I can't never limit myself on what I think, you know, I can do. There's nothing that's impossible, you know, with when I put my mind and my heart to it, you know, that determination and practice. And uh, that's what made me begin to search up dunks. That's what made me begin making me search YouTube. And I knew that if I was going to win these dunk competitions, I needed to be prepared. And I began researching, you know, becoming a student of the game. You know, I watched a lot of different videos from basketball, like the NBA dunk competitions. I watched, I studied every single dunk competition there had ever been, you know, starting with the ABA with Julius Irvin all the way up to the present age, you know. And so I took different things that I saw. I was like, man, I like how he did this dunk. You know, a lot of people remember the winning dunks, but there's also some great dunks that from people who didn't win the contest, you know. So I would be watching all of that. And I bring my own flair to it. When I started launching these dunk videos on YouTube with Ball's Life, that's when I began to showcase, you know, some of these different variations of dunks that people had never done or seen before. You know, millions of views later, people started just calling me the dunk inventor because I was creating so many brand new dunks and variations of new dunks as well. I was going to ask you about, uh, you know, this year at the NBA dunk contest with uh, Zach Levine and Aaron Gordon. Everyone was raving about how it was one of the best ever and... Everyone on C, uh, ESPN was talking about nobody had ever seen anything like the dunk that Gordon did where he was, it looked like he was seated in midair and he grabbed the ball yeah. off the guy that was holding it and took it under both legs. Right. But there's videos, you've been doing that dunk for years. I mean, there's videos all over of you doing that. So what do you think when you hear these sportscasters right. talking about brand new innovations when it's stuff that you've been doing for a while? Well, the fact is, is that they know, but the general people don't know. So, I mean, it's all marketing and advertisement on their end. But the respect of the players is what I care about because when I go to NBA All-Star Weekend and see these guys and all these people, you know, they've watched me for years. They know that even the NBA players couldn't do those kind of things, you know. And so I don't really care when I hear a sports announcer is talking about, oh, this is brand new, nobody's ever done it, you know, especially knowing that it was something that you created because I understand, like, they got to push and promote the players, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the real, you know, the ones that are kind of like they say, real, recognized, real kind of thing that are respectable guys like Kenny Smith and things like that, you know, they got to do their job. But at the end of the day, 
you know, behind off camera, they're like, man, I've, you know, they know who I am and they know what I've done. And especially guys like Zach Levine and Aaron Gordon, you know, Aaron Gordon actually won his high school dunk competition right after I released one of my dunk mixes of a brand new dunk. He actually did it in the NBA contest again as well, where you cock it back bet- behind your head and then cock it back down below your legs mm-hmm. and then finish the dunk reverse. And so he won that with his high school dunk competition. And I've been, uh, uh, I've been fortunate for the past five years for the NBA contest that, you know, I've been, I've been actually contracted with some of these, some of these players, you know, kind of uh, non-disclosure type agreement type things where uh, I've given them uh, creative ideas, dunk routines, even some of them actually work hand in hand uh, with them on their technique to win the competition and for the past five years. You know, pretty much every player has, has been inspired or impacted or, or somehow influenced by me in the dunk competition. So for me, that's kind of like when when that happened with me and my entry, I said, well, if I'm not going to be able to win the NBA contest, then my goal and dream is to have my hands to be able to impact or influence it. You know, for the past five years, that, that dream and goal has, has been true. I don't remember which player. I, it might have been Paul George. It was when Blake Griffin jumped over the car. Yeah. But whoever it was, he was complaining that the dunk contest wasn't about the dunks anymore. It was more about the gimmicks. Yeah. Did you hear about that or did you agree with that sentiment? Yeah, definitely. I mean, for the NBA contest, it was all about these gimmicks. You know, you had guys dunking and what, they turned the lights off and they put glow sticks all over them or something. You know, that's a yeah. gimmick. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You had the uh, the gimmick of like the little guy versus the big guy with Nate Robinson and, and Dwight Howard. You know, there's just a lot of different little gimmick type dunks like that for the NBA contest that was really watering it down. But there's nothing wrong with like props and dunks, but the, it was just like the, 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 the gimmick of it all, you know, uh, that was making it, making it all really weird. Uh, and, and that really just came from the NBA creative team. Like, hey, since, uh, hey, Jeremy Evans, since you're playing for the uh, Utah Jazz, and Carl Malone used to call. They used to call him the mailman. Why don't you do a, a dunk where you jump over the mailman and you know do the you know? So it was like all all that kind of stuff. And you know, you if anybody's to blame, it's kind of like the creative team uh, for the NBA, kind of like trying to write scripts for the contest. The best success for the NBA dunk competitions wasn't stuff that was scripted out. It was just head-to-head battles like Dominique and Michael Jordan and you know Vince coming out with with just a routine that was, you know, nobody had ever seen anything like that before. Um, mm-hmm. And even so, it was still a battle with him, Tracy McGrady, and, and, you know, guys like that. So they didn't need more props. They just needed, the dunkers needed to have more uh, creativity. And honestly, you know, they spend so much time having to train their game. They don't get to work in the gym and do what I do. So it would have been much better for the NBA to do something like bringing me on board to help these dunkers, you know, with style, you know, hey, okay, this guy here, Zach Levine, you're a one-foot jumper, so here's here's 100 dunks that have never been done in the NBA that's off of one foot, you know, and during the time to break it down to mentally telling them, hey, okay, so you got to jump like this, you got you to gotta move your body like that, you know, and all this kind of thing, giving them the technique and the formula to where it makes it really easy for them rather than, going through the trial and error in the gym, like what I've had to do is spend hours in the gym trying to figure things out, you know, allow somebody like me to do that work for them and actually train them and push them into doing it. So it wouldn't be just one person being good anymore. It would be the entire contestants would all have dunks and routines that are specifically customized to their ability. And now you would have more so of a contest where not just only one person is doing good, but the entire show would be good. That's what the people want to see. And you've actually worked out a few little techniques to make the dunk visually look more impressive. I know you talked about right. like holding the ball a little longer. What were some of those techniques and how would you come up with them? Well, it used to be really, if you watched, you know, like Michael Jordan, well, first of all, it's kind of where I, where I got the idea from. When Michael Jordan would jump, he wouldn't just jump. You know, like some of these other dunkers, you know, he he wouldn't just only move his arms with the ball, but he'd also move his legs. And that's what gave him that, that look as if he was walking in the air or flying, you know. He'd bring his legs back or he would bring his legs up and move them around, you know, shift sides. So that's kind of where the style part started coming into the play in the dunk contest, where people would see a regular windmill 
But not only was I just windmilling the ball with my arms, I was also kicking my legs and shifting them in the air to where the style just looked crazy. You know, and then at the same time, you know, when you got a big dunker like Dwight Howard, his legs are hanging. You know, if he's on the rim with his arms, his legs are only 12 inches off the ground. So mm -hmm. visually, people are like, oh, that sucked. You know, he looks stiff and, you know, he barely has to jump. So now when you watch him jump, you know, you, you got him lifting his legs up, you know, bringing his knees up, different things that visually give it that sense of he's higher than what he really is. So those kind of things all begin to come into play as well. You know, when you got the ball, instead of being able to just hold the ball or palming the ball, and, you know, now you're cuffing the ball and you're bringing in a windmill, instead of bringing it around, now you're bringing it up first, then you're bringing it around. Or you're bringing it behind your head first, then you're bringing it around. You know, you were giving different different looks to dunks that they had already been used to, but you were making it look different by adding that own flair and style to it. And that's what was be began bringing more attention and news to Mike. Man, I've never seen that dunk before. When really it was just a windmill, but I added you know a couple extra extra steps to that windmill. How much time do you spend working out new dunks that are for you? Well, back then when I was when I was creating this, you know, kind of helping to build the market of it all, it was a daily you know a daily thing that I would be in the gym on a daily basis. You know, there was times that I would be researching at home, studying, thinking of movements, and then go to the gym and practice and try it out. You know, there was nights that I woke up out of my sleep because I had a dream and I did a crazy dunk in my dream. So I was like, man, I wonder if that's possible. I'd wake up and I'd kind of write it down, script it out, you know, next day go up and go to the gym, try to do it. So it was a daily, a daily thing. You know, not only just practicing dunks, but also practicing to increase your vertical and working and training, you know, for that as well. Um, I was talking to Andy Siegel last week. He's the reigning world champion pool trick shot artist. Uh, and we were talking about how long it takes to get a new trick ready for competition. And he said it usually required something like practicing about 600 times. What is it for dunks? For me, I kind of do it like this. Any new idea, you know, that you could do, you might be able to make that dunk, but like just like on YouTube, you know, you're you're only seeing the dunk that gets made, not necessarily seeing the dunk that, you know, how many times it took them to make the dunk, right? Right. So gotcha. I know for my for myself, my my thing is is like, okay, I'm gonna have all of my dunks that are my 100% guaranteed dunks that I'm gonna make on my first try. Uh, pretty much any dunk that I do. I'm not going to bring it into a contest if I'm not consistently being able to do that dunk within two or three tries. That's pretty much what I go about it. But then there are those dunks that where you're just like, man, nobody's ever done this dunk in a dunk contest, and I want to be the first to pull it out. And so, you know, I there are competitions where I've gone for the gusto, you know, uh, where you only get one, you know, one chance to make a dunk, and it's like, well... I've already won this competition, you know, several times, or maybe I was like, you know, it wasn't so big of a prize money to where it's just like, you know, I'm willing to go all out. Because for me, it's not always about the money, it's more so about the legacy, like pulling off that dunk, you know, that big dunk. So there's been dunk competitions where I've gone for that gusto and missed my dunk and lost the competition, but at least I lost it on my terms, not necessarily lost it because there's been times where other people have made a weak dunk and I could have just did a simple windmill dunk and won the competition, but still went for that big dunk that nobody's ever seen or done before. So how much strategy is involved in a dunk contest? Uh, there's always a strategy. I mean, just like any game, any contest, there's always a bit of strategy involved. It's important to know your competition. It's important to know, you know, the style. It's important to know who the judge is, you know, because there's all kinds of things that are on the fly for me that I use in my creativeness for the dunk competitions. Um, like I said, strategy-wise, when I won the dunk contest with the blindfold dunk, the reason why I even thought to do it blindfolded is because I was researching and realized that, hey, it was 20, it's the 20th anniversary since Cedric Zabalas won the NBA contest with a blindfold dunk. So, being as the 20th anniversary, I'm going to go ahead and reach out to Cedric Zabalas and see if he'll blindfold me and do the dunk, you know? So, mm -hmm. there's a story, there's a creativeness, you know, and there's a strategy behind that as well. You had talked a little bit ago about a mobile app that you've got coming out. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? 
Sure. Well, today you got so many different social media networks where, you know, you tell people, hey, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Facebook, follow me on Instagram, follow me on YouTube, Snapchat, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, I wanted to have one place where I could connect with my friends, fans, and family and also give creative content um, that they would want to see that's all in one place. So the idea of creating a mobile app to me was a no-brainer. Also, the fact is is that you know when you look at people on their social media, you have maybe 100,000 followers on one page, 100,000 po- followers on another page, uh, and only 10,000 followers on the other page. You know, So it's inconsistent. With me, for a mobile app, I just wanted to be able to have all my audience in one place where I can put videos, training videos, motivational videos, my dunk videos, my lifestyle, just different things like that, all about me, where I can actually connect and, you know, engage my fans and users. And that's what I decided to invest my money in and and pull off. What advice do you give to people? I know what you do as far as the motivational speaking and keeping your life on focus, but if somebody comes up to you and they really want to pursue basketball or dunk contest or their thing, what kind of advice do you give them? Um, well, I talk to them about, you know, figuring out what it is that they're passionate about because, you know, a lot of people love the idea of being a professional athlete but they don't realize the work that it takes that goes into it. If you're just only driven by the money, I mean, a lot of people, once their body is being put to the test, will kind of, they'll, they'll fold up. If it's something that, that drives you beyond that, you know, if it's a passion and purpose-driven type of lifestyle that you're after, it seems that, you know, they're, they're willing to go and push through the pain and the sacrifice and the blood, sweat, and tears, you know? So... First thing I try to do is challenge them as far as why do they want that so bad? You know, then it gets them thinking about why they're doing what they're doing. You know, they're able to identify, well, you know, I want to do this to be able to help my mom, my family, and things like that. Well, great. Remember your mom, remember your family, uh, you know, that next morning when you've woken up after a bad workout and your whole entire body is sore and you don't want to, you know, go to the gym that day. You know, remember your family, remember the things that you're talking about. So, you know, all those kind of things of putting that into perspective for them, for their lives. Then the other thing is letting them know that, you know, we all are the same. We all have the same capabilities, you know, uh, and we're all given the same 24 hours in a day. The only thing that separates me from the other people is that I've chosen to sacrifice time of entertainment where watching TV or playing video games and other things that I could be doing, I've chosen to invest my time rather than waste it or being entertained by going into training and doing the other things that I need to do. So, you know, taking accountability over their time. And once they, once they've able to understand why they're doing what they're doing and what they're passionate about, and then also understand that it's something that they're going to have to work for and, and intentionally pursue. then now they're more, in a place of understanding of what their goal and dream is going to have to take for them to get there. All right, so if your job only paid the bills and not a penny more than that, would you still keep doing it? Yeah, I mean, like, I, like I've like i often said, even if I didn't get paid for what I was doing right now, like I said, it's not a, the money What not what matters to me because obviously if it was about the money, I would honestly would be doing something else. So um, it's more so about the impact and the inspiration that I'm providing. You know, it's about the platform that basketball and dunking has given me to be able to even speak into other people's lives like that. So, yeah, regardless of the money, I definitely would be doing what I'm doing. What talent or skill do you not have that you wish you did? The video editing software kind of guru, you know, video editing, graphic design work, being able to build a website, build an app, you know, build, you know, build things because everything we do is all based on a digital market. Uh, Fill in the blank. I'm a success if I inspire someone else to succeed. And what about I'm a failure if I I'm a failure if I, I give up. You know, if I if I stop if I start thinking about my own self and stop thinking about other people, I would consider that a failure. What is the single best piece of advice you followed to get where you are today? Probably what my in my dad's words that life is about choices. Every single day you gotta wake up and choose to do something that's gonna take you one step ahead of where you were yesterday. Whether that's in training or if that's in, you know, in your marriage or in your relationship as a father, son, daughter, mother, whatever you are, 
making that choice to to get better than you were yesterday. What is a piece of well-intentioned or well-meaning advice someone gave you that you're actually glad you ignored to get where you are today? There's always people who think about things just on a financial standpoint. So I'd have to say probably just the mindset of get your money, you know, go after, get money and then, and then after that, you know, use the money to impact people or whatever. Money is not the priority in life in general. There's a lot of people that have chased money first and end up losing their entire vision for, for their own life um, or now just chasing their own selfish dreams. What character trait do you like best about yourself? Uh, probably the fact that I would put others needs above my own and what about the character trait you like least about yourself so the character tra trait that i would like least about myself is how selfish i, I can I, I can be fill in the blank i believe every child should have the opportunity to watch one of my dumb shows no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> um I believe every child should have the opportunity to feel loved and, you know, appreciated and know, knowing that they are, you know, that there's, that there's a plan and a purpose for their life. If you could suggest one piece of self-improvement that everyone on earth would adopt, what would it be? Definitely to put God first in their lives. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oh, man. Flying, of course. You already do that. Jeez, but, shoot, if I could fly <laughs> in real life, that would be awesome. That was always my dream. That was always, in every comic, as I was a kid, every comic book I ever read, it was like, man, I, you know, my superpower would be to fly. Which is kind of cool now that I've created my own comic book and become a superhero when these kids read my comic book and they hear my story and then all of a sudden I show up at their classroom a month or two months later. You know, you kind of become a superhero. And then I put on my put on my uniform and go out there and fly for them. Jumping over their teachers and the principals and all that stuff, it kind of uh, brings that whole superpower into real life. If you could have dinner with anyone, alive or dead, who would it be? Man, that's a good question. My childhood inner inner child right now is screaming out to say Michael Jackson because I love Michael Jackson and singing and dancing to it as a kid. An hospitable nearby planet has been discovered and you've been recruited to help colonize it. And you're allowed to take any three personal items that you wish. What are they? <laughs> my three personal items? I guess I'd, I'd have to take my, my Bible. I love hunting and I love shooting, so I'd have to say I'd have to take my, my rifle. Man, I don't know if they even have a basketball court out there, but I, I guess I should say my basketball. Take a hoop with you. I'll give you the hoop and the ball. Yeah, be able to teach, be able to teach, uh, teach people how to play the game. All right, final question. You've just won a Lifetime Achievement Award, and we want to hear your acceptance speech. So there won't be any music to cue you or rush you off the stage so you can get to all of the thank yous that you need and any personal cause that you want to make people aware of, this is your soapbox. So let her rip. You know, first and foremost, I have to thank God. I'd have to thank my family, my mother and my father for all the things that they've done, you know, and also not even, not only just the good things and the bad things and you know, everything that we've been able to learn that I've learned through them. Um, my sister for always being there for me, loving me. And uh, my wife, who's by my side, who's my partner and best friend, my oldest daughter and my, and my baby princess, both, both of my girls who are kind of the light of my life, caused me to have that passion to continue to push myself every morning. I mean, I have to say the rest of my family, you know, all of my family and friends and fans that are out there that I know they're counting on me to continue to do what I'm doing and uh, making the impact in people's lives. Short and sweet. Well, Kenny, you're officially off the hot seat, man. I sure appreciate you doing this. All right, awesome. It was great talking with you. Thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Once again, that was international slam dunk champion Kenny Dobbs. For more information on Kenny, training DVDs, upcoming events, and more, please visit his website at kennydobbs.com. I'd like to thank everyone for joining me today. You are listening to the Live to Create podcast, and this is Shane Omgren reminding you to dream big, be inspired, and live creatively.